Well, I think we are live. So I want to say hi to everyone. This is our first live gaming discussion. So some of you are probably joining us live, I hope, and uh, some of you might be joining us later. But however you're joining us, I'm just glad you're here and welcome. But let's start um, by introducing ourselves because I am here with two other gentlemen as well. John, do you mind introducing everyone to who you are? Well, my name is John Gallant. I'm based out of Nova Scotia in Canada. Pretty involved with my local board game community. I run lots of events in the area. And at the end of March, I ran a really successful tabletop day event where we raised over $1,600 for charity. So it was a good time of games. Very nice. Over to you, Hi. Keith. Can you hear me? It says I'm muted. Oh, well, unmute yourself in the top corner. I can hear you fine. Can everyone hear? Can you hear him, John? Yeah, I can hear him fine. Well, I think you can go ahead then. Okay, Keith. Then I'll go ahead as long as you can hear me now. <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> uh, I'm Keith Collins. Uh, I live in Seymour, Indiana, uh, just down the road from Gen Con. Um, and I'm just a board gamer, and I started in the hobby about three years ago, directly due to attending Gen Con and picking up my first hobby board game. Wow. Very nice. Well, I'm I'm Rodney Smith, and I run a, uh, a web series called Watch It Played, where we teach a game, and then we invite our viewers to play along with us, and we play the game. Um, and I've been a gamer for several years, and um, that leads us really to why we're all here together to talk about this discussion on gaming. We're going to talk about Gen Con, and, which is going to be this year, uh, 2013, running August 15th to 18th. But specifically, we want to talk about event registration, which starts uh, May 19th of 2013. And we want to talk about how you go about deciding which events you want to attend um, from, and how you attend, really, from three different perspectives, because we all are coming at this with, with different degrees of experience. Uh, Keith, what's, uh, what's your experience of uh, Gen Con? Uh, 2013 will be my fifth Gen Con. The veteran um, I, of the group. <laughs> I first attended Gen Con because it's an hour away. I saw what was going on. I knew some people uh, that I went to college with that went. Uh, I decided to go up, check it out, meet with my old college friends, and while I was waiting for them, I just did a lot of wandering of the exhibit hall and doing some things. I did that for two years. During the second year, I saw a board game. I saw this huge booth in the exhibit hall for Fantasy Flight Games. <laughs> what is this? store within this place <laughs> and I demoed my first game at Gen Con I'm like this is awesome and it's a game I still own but it's kind of mediocre really but it was the coolest game I'd ever played in my life at that point so I bought a game and I started buying more games and more games so then I went to Gen Con again the next <laughs> year and I'm like well now by now I'm into board games I'm buying the things I'm playing the things um, <laughs> so I've decided well I'm gonna go for a few more days and I'm gonna stay at a hotel out on the outer loop so it's a little bit cheaper and you know with 15 minute drive from the convention center that was a good time that wasn't enough so last year I go up, I drag most of my gaming group with me, we get a hotel, we're there Wednesday night to Sunday afternoon, and we game until we're half dead. And this year we're doing the same thing, but we moved even closer to an even more centrally attached hotel with another person from the gaming group, so we're ready for the full-on Gen Con. So next year you're <laughs> going to be actually staying within the convention hall itself, setting up a tent, right? <laughs> uh, that's my plan. Is I'm going to rappel into the exhibit hall at night so I can see all the good stuff. <laughs> well, John, tell us about you, man. Like, what, what's your experience? Because I think it might be a little different than Keith's. <laughs> Just a little bit, as I have never been to Gen Con. Now I hear, I hear. This is a rumor. It's the best four days in gaming. So who knows? Um, but I have a bit of a different perspective going in this year because my girlfriend is actually going to accompany me. So going through the event listing, I have a kind of an eye for the spousal activities that are that are offered. Uh, get your mind out of the gutter. <laughs> Neither Keith or I were going there. John, how dare you? <laughs> well, and myself... You, Rod, you, have a, you have a year up on me on that. I do. I have a year because last year was my first year to attend. I, I went with my friend Pat McDonald and 
we, yeah, I'm a bit of a media junkie, a board game media junkie, so I love listening to different podcasts, and all of them rave about Gen Con, because it's the largest gaming convention in North America, and they all talk about how fantastic it was, and I was filling my head with this, so I really started to think, there's no way it can possibly live up to this expectation. However, it certainly did, and more so. So I, uh, I had a great time last year, and I'm really, really looking forward to going back this year. So, so we really do have three very different perspectives here based on our experience, and I think that will hopefully lend to some interesting thoughts about this particular topic. So this, this issue about getting event tickets, well, why do you even need event tickets in the first place? What's that all about? Well, at Gen Con, there are... Um, a multitude of events that you can go uh, into and you need tickets generally to get into most of them. I'd say the vast majority of them you need some form of tickets and having that ticket reserves your space in that particular event that you want to attend um, and there's there's basically one way and really only one way to get these tickets and that's to order them and you have to do it online through the uh, Gen Con um, website. Now, Keith, can you also get them at the Gen Con event itself, or do you have to order them no, online? No, you can get them at Gen Con at the site itself. Uh, you can pull out the big catalog of Doom, uh, <laughs> the uh, i.e. the uh, big program books that you pick up all over at Gen Con when you register. And yeah. The entire catalog's in that book, and you can actually fill out the event you want to write on slips of paper and wait in line and hand it to an agent where you can book it at the uh, gate and get your ticket handed right back to you. You can also, during Gen Con, use their app for the iPhone, and I, they may have it for Android now, and you can actually do some uh, ticket purchases directly from the app, I think, but I, I could be wrong. Right, so at this point, you're stuck having to order online. Um, so you need to have a badge first. We're not going to really get into that, but a badge is basically the, the big ticket. This is how you get into Gen Con itself. It's really what's going to allow you to go into, say, the main dealer hall. Uh, certain security points are going to be checking to see that you have the badge. So if you want to order an event ticket on the website, you have to first have purchased a badge and have that attached to your account. Um, and there's two tip types of tickets that you can get. You can get specific tickets for the specific event. That Those will range in price from, you know, $2 um, all the way up to, I don't know, some of them get pretty pricey, um, maybe $40 or more. But most of them are, are you know, pretty reasonably priced. You might be looking at 4 to $6 for a, for a, a decent event. For but a standard gaming session, it's $2 an hour, basically. There you go. There you go. So, and, and $2 is the cost of a generic ticket. Correct. So a generic ticket, here's how this works. So let's just say you, um, you're going by a table that was set up as an event, maybe a role-playing session. So there was room for five people to attend uh, this event, and four of them show up who had paid the full price for that event. Let's say it was $6. And they're sitting at the table, but there's an empty seat. And you're walking by, and the event's about to start. You've been interested in it, but you weren't ready to commit. You can go up to that table and say to the person running it, and say, listen, if you, don't have, if you have a seat available, this person hasn't shown up, I can, I, I can give you my generic tickets to, uh, to get that seat. So since it would have cost $6, you would have to give three generic tickets the equal value of $6. And they should allow you to sit there, assuming that that person uh, who originally had bought the ticket doesn't show up. Or if someone just never did buy the ticket at all, you can use your generic tickets to get in that way as well. Right, Keith? That's how that works. That right? is 100% correct. Okay, excellent. And according to the most recent episode of the Dice Tower, you have to throw your generic tickets at the event organizers to make sure you get first dibs if there's a lineup. Of people right. <laughs> Only it's very, simple. very handy yeah. from the Dice Tower. you gotta, you got to pay attention to that. They know what they're talking about, too. Um, I tell you, so, nothing feels better than being seated at one of those tables when you've got ten guys with generic tickets who didn't get into that event who just really want that seat. Oh, yeah, pre-planning. And, and that's really what this is all evil. about, right? It's, <laughs> it's pre-planning. That's what this is all yeah, about, right? it is about pre-planning. So you can, you can be that person. You can be Keith at the table sitting there staring smugly at the other people. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm not above that. It's a game within a game. <laughs> now, the thing about ordering these tickets is you can do it right up to the last day of Gen Con, um, you can be uh, buying these tickets. You don't have to do it in advance if you choose to, to put things off. Or maybe you discover a ticket later on uh, or an event later on that you might like to go to. But there's usually a limit of two tickets per person per event. So you couldn't 
say, um, buy all the tickets for Fantasy Flights in Flight Report uh, and <laughs> just to show up to the room alone. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. say, I've booked the whole thing. <laughs> or scalp. <laughs> yeah, or scalp the tickets. Now, some events, I think they do let you buy more than two, but it's very limited. Um, so that's that's something you need to keep in mind. So that's a, sort of a, a general overview. But, John, let's talk a little bit about how to search. How do you search for these events? Because there's all kinds of them. How do we narrow it down? Yeah, that's right. And when you go ahead and look to see how many events are actually offered, you see that there's actually over 9,000 different events going on over the four days. So oh, you, my goodness. So you can insert your, your Dragon Ball Z joke there, <laughs> over 9,000. So if you go to the main Gen Con website, which is going to be brought up momentarily, then what you're going to see when you first log in, and again, you have to have an account with the Gen Con site, but we're not going to go through that process at the moment, but this is what you'll see. And over here on the left, you have a Find Events link. So we'll click on that, and you see all these nice shiny icons listing the categories and the different genres of events that are there. So you have your main board game events, you have some electronic gaming, you have some role-playing, you have different seminars that people put on. You have those spousal activities that I was mentioning earlier and lots of other things. So when you go into, let's say, just pick a board game right here, you see that there are 25, over 2,500 records of different board game events going on. So that's intimidating to say the least. <laughs> Absolutely. And let's just say that, okay, well, that's, that's a little too much. So I'm interested in Catan things. Everybody really likes Catan. So up here in the game system, I'll type in Catan and see what comes up. So we have 174 different Catan-related events. So that's kind of crazy in and of itself. But hey, this mammoth, mammoth uh, Catan Jr. Uh, let's pick that one. That sounds fun. I want to go to that. <laughs> okay, so you click in here, and you see a description of the event, when it's going to take place, how long it's going to be, where it is, pretty much all the information you need to, to go to this event. And over to the right here, you also have some check boxes that allow you to kind of add this event to a wish list, which we'll talk more a little bit more uh, later. And this just gets you kind of planning your, your con, even though it's only May. But us gamers, we don't have any OCD like tendencies at all, so we would never do any pre-planning like this. So let's just click on the the title here because maybe this time period, this Thursday at 9 a.m., doesn't really fit with with your other plans. So let's click on that and see if oh, and it brings up all the different Mammoth Catan Junior games that are happening throughout the con. So if you're really interested in that event, you can see all the different times that it are uh, that is going on at. So you can pick one that fits within your schedule which is really handy. So I've gone through that already and picked out the events that I was looking towards and I've gone ahead and put them into a Google Calendar. So this might look like a dog's breakfast to, to some people, but this shows me exactly what I want to do over the course of the con. Still need some tweaking a little bit, but it's a good idea of, of what's going to go on for me. But to get to that point, I certainly did not use this method of searching for events because it's a little time consuming. It's not the greatest method for browsing. So then Keith, you're going to tell us a little bit about uh, your method for, for browsing that other people might find useful. Sure. There's a couple of other methods you can use. Um, there's an external website that uh, kind of data mines Gen Con site and Gen Con themselves actually provide a spreadsheet that you can download. So hopefully you're seeing my spreadsheet now. And this is downloaded directly from Gen Con in their community section. In their files section, you can find the event listing. Um, once you get an event listing, you'll want to turn your filters on because that's where you can actually start to manipulate this spreadsheet of doom. Um, so there's a lot of information in here and the the um, cells are all shrunken down and you can move those around as you wish. So, um, for example, I want to figure out who's 
companies, games am I interested in checking out? And so I can go filter that, scroll through, and we'll just go, since we're using a behemoth spreadsheet, we'll go to a behemoth company, and eventually I'll find, because I'm slow, uh, Fantasy Flight Games, because I know they have lots of events. And so now we see every event that Fantasy Flight Games has currently scheduled for Gen Con 2013. Um, then that's a little bit messy, so we're going to filter out by event type, and we're going to look for both. We're interested in board games, and we're interested in non-collectible card games. That's not going to dent narrow it down a whole lot with Fantasy <laughs> Flight, since that's all that's they true. do. But, okay, let's say now I'm actually just interested. I'm interested in Android Netrunner because I like Android Netrunner. I'm interested in the Battlestar Galactica expansion. I'm interested in Blood Bowl Team Manager. And now you can see we've got all the events for those particular types that uh, Fantasy Flight currently has scheduled. Um, then I can sort these things ascending by title to get them all nice and organized. And then you can see we've got five or six Battlestar events, several Blood Bowl events. It'll show you the minimum number of players, the maximum number of players, the age requirements, the level of experience you're supposed to have. For example, the Android Netrunner National Championship. You're supposed to be an expert, so you know what you're doing. It's got the start date, the start times, the durations, uh, contacts, and all the stuff that's on the website itself, just in one thing. Um, but you can go just copy that. Um, event number out of that cell then go back and paste it in on the Gen Con website to go directly to that event to be a shortcut to get there. Um, from there we've got one other site I like to use and this one is gencon.highprogrammer.com if you can see this at this point. Um, and so this mines the data from Gen Con spreadsheet. And whenever there's a new update to the spreadsheet, they'll go and update it, and they've got this nice recent changes uh, link. And you click on that. There haven't been any changes since it was posted, so we're going to get everything right now. Um, but that's a good thing. Once the events are posted and they start making changes, that's the best way to see what's been added new, what may have been canceled that you had been watching, things like that. They also have a much more powerful search tool that you can use where you can look for number of tickets available, the game starts at or finishes by the game system, the event title. Uh, you can look for the game master, the host group, age requirements, and all that stuff, and then hit check marks for the different categories you want to look for events in. Um, and that are two other ways that you can use to search for Gen Con events. Yeah, those are both good. They, they certainly seem like an improvement over the, the core method, so yeah, hopefully people will find that, that helpful. But how do, we, uh, how do we actually place the orders for these, these tickets once we found what we want? Yeah, so once you pick the search method of your choice, then you can go back to the Gen Con site. And so we're back here. I think you can see my screen there now. So I'm back at my Mammoth Catan Jr. because, again, that looks like fun. And over in the checkboxes, I'm going to say I want a ticket for myself. And I can add that ticket to my wish list. So I'll go ahead and do that. Okay, so it's been successfully added. And I'm going to go check that wish list out. So I've already, and you see a nice little countdown to when you can panic and submit your, <laughs> the process. That's great. And he's going to mention something about not panicking a little later. But here's my wish list of a whole bunch of stuff. There's over $100 worth of events here. And you see these numbers in the left-hand side. You can rank each event by priority, so the ones you really, really want to get in on. And for those ones that may only be offered once over the course of the con, uh, rather than this Mammoth Catan, which is like 20 different times happening. So playing fleet with the designers, that's only happening once over the four days. So I want to make sure I can get in on that. So that's why I'm ranking that number one. Nope, and I'm going to snipe you now. 
Oh. Yeah, you might have just made a big mistake there, John. There might be a big fun on that event now. I'm not going to say, I played with those guys last year, and they were fantastic. So I think if you get into that, you'll have a great time. Really, really nice guys. I have to like edit this out now so people can't see. There, you can't see my events now. You can also sort it by start times. So that's just going to give a chronological order of when your events are going to take place. So once you, so you have, as we can see, two days and 14 hours and some change to modify your wish list to your content. And once event registration opens on May 19th, then you can submit that wish list for processing. And, what, and that's not going to get you your, your tickets. That's just going to add them to your cart based on your priority, from what I understand. And then you'll be able to check out and actually pay for those event tickets themselves. Yeah, as soon as that clock hits zero, there's going to be a good 20,000 geeks like us hit that button at the same time. And if you're lucky, you'll only be number 1,200 in line, which is what I was last year. And it took a good 45 to 50 minutes till my turn in line to process. And Gen Con's bigger this year than it was last year. So it's going to take a while. Be patient. When you hit the button, it's going to take a while. But don't leave expecting it to all be done and you can come back in three hours because that's the other problem is you have to be there and it only holds those tickets in your cart for a certain amount of time before they'll expire is generally how that works. So you want to be there to complete your transaction when it finishes. But it's going to look like you're not moving in line. You're going to think you've frozen up. That's not the case. If worse comes to worse, you can hit refresh on your browser. It'll keep your place in line and all that kind of thing. So you'll be fine. Once that wish list processes, you're going to find out you did not get all the events you wanted if you have a significant list. Um, that's just the way it works. I tried to get in on Descent 2.0 last year. It was gone. I saw another Descent 2.0 with four open slots. As soon as I noticed I didn't get that one, I hit the button, I resubmitted, and by now the line was down. It was gone before I could process. <laughs> so I couldn't get in a Descent 2.0 last year. That's just What's how that? it was. But once that process is in your cart, now you're not going to have electronic tickets like you say. Sometimes get at the movie theater on your phone. So I assume you're going to get some like a physical thing you're going to give to somebody. So how do you guys get that? Well, mine, um, I had to pick mine up at what they call the will call desk. So when you go to the convention, um, and the nice thing I remember last year is they had the will call desk open early and not well, early late <laughs> late in the day um, before uh, the convention started so uh, we arrived me and Pep arrived quite late like after midnight and we were able to go get in line at one or two o'clock in the morning and and get our tickets because we wanted to have them so come day one zero hour we could get into uh, the uh, get our badges and get into the events that we wanted to get into so uh, we had to wait in line it wasn't too bad uh, at two o'clock in the morning it probably shouldn't be too bad <laughs> um, and uh, and we got our tickets there they had in an envelope you give them your name and I think maybe I don't know if they asked for identification Keith uh, or not but uh, but then we got our we got our, our tickets so I had to roll call so yeah were there any problems with the tickets did you get everything you had you had bought that's actually a good question. Uh, I got everything that I had bought. Pep didn't, but that was because they had put them in two different uh, envelopes, and I'm having a little bit of trouble remembering right now why that was. I don't know if they had just they just had two separate envelopes for them. So she saw one, grabbed it, and gave it to him, and then they went back afterwards and realized, oh, there's a second, there's a second envelope. Um, but they definitely did have the tickets. Uh, he just didn't realize until we got back to the hotel room. Hey, wait! I had other stuff, and it's not in here. So, so no, and they were very good about about getting all that up and going. Um, and of course, they can they have the computers there. They can go confirm and check and, and see what you ordered and what you haven't. So, I I would be surprised if anyone ran into any significant problems that way. So, what about you, Keith? I think you get your tickets a little bit differently. Yeah, I I. See, my problem was I, when I first went to Con, I saw the real will call lines that used to exist until last year they experimented with having it open overnight on uh, Wednesday night to Thursday. And, I mean, you would see a line for will call lined up from the will call desk all the way to the other end of the convention center. Uh, it was huge, and it was a good long line. And I said, I will never deal with that. You know, I just don't. My time's worth more than standing in that line at Gen Con because I have games to play. 
So <laughs> play games in line. <laughs> two other options: you can use the U.S. Postal Service and pay for that delivery, or you can pay a little, little extra and do FedEx. Uh, I choose to do FedEx. It actually takes longer than the Postal Service delivery usually, but you get a tracking number if it disappears. Gincon will work with you to get you taken care of. If the Postal Service loses it, it's gone. And they tell you that if you choose Postal Service, that there's no guarantee if your envelope gets lost, it won't be replaced. So I use FedEx and pay that little extra. That way it all shows up. And I do a lot of buying tickets for my friends. At the same time, I buy mine if they're going to use the same thing so that they don't have to pay the postage. So I'll buy my friends' badges. I'll buy their other things. And we'll just get this one big box of goodies delivered. I'm very jealous because um, I'm also in Canada like John. And last year I know, and I think it's still true this year, I went looking on the website to find it if it changed. I don't think it has. They will not uh, ship they will not ship your tickets or your badge to international uh, attendees, which is unfortunate. I hope at some point in time they change it, because I'd certainly be willing to pay the, uh, the extra money just to have that stuff in hand and know that I don't have to wait in any kind of line at all. Um, but, um, but yeah, so, so John, you and I will be waiting in line, I think, uh, Wednesday night, hopefully, to get those tickets. And we'll bring string railway or something to play. That's, well, listen, I remember Keith was talking about the real lines uh, for Will Call, and he's right. I remember uh, Tom Vassell put up a video. I think it was from 2011 Gen Con, and he did a video just of the line, and it was it was long and crazy. So, uh, so it's really nice what they've done to try to speed that up. And I remember seeing um, pictures of people playing games in line. I remember seeing uh, Russ Wakelin from the D6 Generation. He was playing... Uh, Space Hulk Death Angel, I think, in line with some people. So, so yeah, it's a great time to if you if you do get stuck in line, everyone's a gamer there. Everyone wants to game, um, so it isn't hard to find a game. And we want to talk about now some of the events, some of the top events that we're interested in attending. Um, John, do you do you want to start? Maybe give us like yeah, you know, sure. Your, sure. Okay, great. So as I mentioned, because there's that over 9,000 different things to pick from, it was a little intimidating at first. But once I got through, got over that like spreadsheet of doom hump, then narrowed it down to really what I wanted to play. I'm, I'm pretty excited. So, can I jump in just for one second? Because I got to say, John, your the spreadsheet that you created is. That's awesome. I look at that, and I'm so jealous. I think that's phenomenal that you created that, showing the overlap of different events and which oh, ones. That's just, in, uh, that's just in Google Calendar, so anybody that has a Gmail account can definitely do that up. And you, you had different colors. Were they color-coded for a reason? Um, they, I didn't. They just had some different options just to distinguish there. Okay. Actually, I'll just pop. Yeah, yeah the true nerds always that. do that. That's <laughs> what I threw here for my whole group. I had all three of us that were going said, here's where our events are, and here's where you are, and here's where we are, and this is where we've all got stuff. And Absolutely. I had a sheet last year, too. It wasn't nearly as cool looking as John's. Let's let's look at John's, though. Uh, John's is pretty. I'll give you yeah. that. that. That looks fantastic. And I can't take all the credit. Google did a fair bit behind the scenes. So I have my four-day calendar here, and kind of at a glance can see what's going on at what time. You see some overlap there. That's just because I haven't decided quite yet if I'm going to go to the AEG extravaganza or the go. Dice Tower or LARP Chess. So Keith may convince me of one thing or another later on. But what's also nice is you can have that four-day view. It's almost like they custom made it for Gen Con, four days. Or you can go to the agenda view, and that just shows a nice little list right in a row of an itinerary, essentially. So that's that's pretty handy, and since it's it's like I'm working for Google, but if uh, if you have an Android phone, this calendar will actually be on my phone, so I don't have to have a laptop or anything checking it or print it out or none of that crazy old fashioned business. All right, fancy pants, tell us about your uh, your events. Yeah, so as I mentioned, number one on my list there was Fleet with the Designers. Fleet's a, a great auction game set in the Canadian Arctic as a fisherman. It's way more fun than it actually sounds. But uh, now it's great, and I've heard some interviews with the designers, and they sound like some good guys And based on your comments there. So that's going to be fun. And if I can give them a trouncing, which I'm hoping to do, there's a, there's a prize involved. So that's, that's kind of my main thing. 
And then I've also kickstarted a game called Compounded through Dice Hate Me Games, and they're doing some some demos of that there. So I want to get in and try that before it's going to arrive in the mail. I expect it actually when I get back from Gen Con to to have it waiting for me, which is nice. You do know Daryl owes you a hug because that was part of the deal for kickstarting. If he sees you at Gen Con, he has to hug you. Oh, I'll hug. I'll hug Daryl. <laughs> Yeah, so Compounded is a, a chemistry theme game. So I'm a big science guy. So that's that's right up my alley. I used to be and, a chemist. <laughs> oh, very nice. And I've never really gotten into any role playing games. Uh, I played Dungeons and Dragons once in like grade ten, and which is a while ago. But Mouse Guard is a comic book series that I really enjoy, and there's a role playing game based on that. So uh, Ryan did me a favor and picked up the Mouse Guard role-playing game guidebook, the source book, for me. And I've picked up that a little bit, and it looks like a really interesting gaming system. So I'm definitely going to check that out, because Gen Con is all about trying different gaming experiences that you might not get a chance to do. Chance to do. And this is the last thing I'll mention, uh, other than the open gaming, because I think everybody knows about the open gaming library where you can just go in, pick something off the shelf, and... If you just wanted to do that for four days, you could. So other than that, I'm going to go back in time a little bit with my uh, some video game nostalgia and play four hours, I think, of GoldenEye for the Nintendo 64. It really revolutionized the first-person shooter genre. And I was pretty good back in the day, so I want to see if I still have the skills on that one. <laughs> what about you, Keith? What are some things that uh, you're looking forward to? Number one on my list this year, it's the... Uh Gen Con game library. Um, I, I had a really good time there last year. It was my first time experiencing the Gen Con game library. Uh, they moved it to a bigger area last year than it had been. The library's grown. Um, you go in there and it's kind of a who, who's who of the people that review vid, uh, board games and uh, shoot videos for board games in that room. Uh, I ran into about everybody I've ever seen on YouTube uh, in that room um, and played with my friends. I played a game with Rodney in there. Uh, we yeah, played Smash, Up. Smash Up. I think yeah. I won. But yeah, you did. You I did, Keith. Uh, that's yeah. not surprising. Uh, <laughs> um, but, yeah, that's my favorite thing and what I'm looking forward to the most. Um, outside of that, I had a really good time at the AEG Big Game Night. Um just it's all AEG games. There's a ton of people. There's people to teach you games you've never played. It's a lot better setting than just doing the demos in the exhibition hall because you get a lot more. You well, know, you get to play the full game if that's what you want to do. If you get part way through it and decide you don't like it, you can get up and go play something else. Uh, this year, though, I'm going out of my comfort zone and I'm going to volunteer and try to help teach games at the AEG game night. Um, so. I'm going to miss the uh, Dice Tower podcast, but it's worth it to go do the AG game night. Uh, the folks at AG really are a bunch of good people. Uh, they treat you really well, and there's a lot of good gamers there at that event. In addition to just playing their games, they raffle off huge stacks of games at this event, and everybody leaves with a swag pack that is worth probably two, three times what you pay for it. The event is actually pricey at $32, but in our case, we got a limited edition gold foil copy of Smash Up in our box. We got a full game of one of the Nightfall games, um, L5R starter last year, and some promos in this big box. And oh, wow. we have no idea what it'll be this year because it's always a surprise. Um, so it I really look forward to that. Doesn't it all come in that event. giant bag? Like it's no, crazy. it actually just came in a little white box. Oh, it did. Oh, okay, yeah. it just came in a little white box. And when you talk about it, I have heard about the AEG bag. The AEG bag is massive. You could fit a couple of small children in that bag. <laughs> you could you fit a couple of adults in that thing. <laughs> it was pretty big. It's the biggest bag I'd ever seen at Gen Con. Uh, so that's one of the big events. And outside of that, I've been through the event list, and there's nothing else that's really got me saying, this is something I have to buy in advance. And one thing I'm working on doing from 
two years ago and even last year. I'm cutting back on the number of scheduled events unless it's something I really want to do. It's really easy to overschedule yourself for Gen Con, and you've got to remember somewhere in there you have to eat, somewhere in there you have to go to the bathroom, uh, you're going to want to sit and visit with people, and there's a lot of things you can find outside of the events that are really interesting to do. So I've decided to leave myself a lot more of that time uh, than just being scheduled and having to feel like I'm rushed from place to place to place. And that's something I was pretty conscious of, too. As a first-timer, I've heard the horror stories of people way over-scheduling them, themselves, and, and that can actually cost you a lot of money because if you sign up for a lot of things in advance, you bought those tickets, and if you don't go to them, then that's money kind of down, down the toilet. Um, and I hear... Gen Con's kind of big. Like the venue itself is kind of big. Is that correct? Yes. Big. Um, big is a little bit of an understatement because <laughs> okay. Gen Con's at the Indianapolis Convention Center, which is a massive building. But it's not just there. Events are at every one of those connecting hotels as well. Yeah. So you could finish an event at four o'clock. Say I've got time to get to this four thirty event. No, you're over in the Hyatt, and your event is at the JW Marriott on the third floor in the back corner. You're not going to make it. So, yeah, that's something to keep in mind, too, for people uh, when they start to look and start to schedule their events. If you have back-to-back -back things, you have to account for walking time because we don't have teleportation technology yet, unfortunately. No, absolutely right. I had the same thing last year. I was um, at one event and then had to get over to uh, the D6 Generations live mob event. And, you know, they did a pretty good job of indicating where things were with some signs and that. But, you know, unless you live there, how do you know? And even if you live there, who who, who goes and stays in hotels when they live in the place? So so you do have to find your way through the labyrinth of halls and things. Um, so you definitely, you're right, you, you do want to give yourself some time. And, and kind of like Keith, this year I'm trying be careful about what I schedule myself for. Uh, I have a couple of things though, uh, like you guys, the gaming library, and you both talked about that a little bit. I won't go on at length about it, but basically it is that big open room you can go into. You, can, you can have to buy separate tickets, so there's a ticket for the daytime and there's a ticket for uh, nighttime, um, sort of the after hours once the dealer hall closes. And uh, that's a very popular place to go because there's a there's a massive library of games there. You uh, you sign you sign them out, and then you can keep them for as long as you want to play with them. And you have to return them, of course, when you're done. But they're quite well organized, and there's a, a really good selection. And uh, in that room, I believe, if you're looking for players, you don't have players. You can put a flag up on your table so people walking around know that you're looking for players and can that's jump correct. in and join you. And everyone's they also really extended the hours this year. Did they? 8 a.m. to 4 a.m. No, to 4 a.m. Because what was it last year? It was was it more like one or two, or was I think it even? It was two a.m. or yeah. three last year, and now it's four. So, yeah. Uh, so just the... a quick question there, Rodney, before you go on to the other things you're interested in, while we're still talking about the library. Sure. I noticed in the, in the wish list that you have an option to buy a ticket for yourself, but you can also buy another ticket for yourself. Is that because of issues with the gaming library area, where if you go in and come back out? You have to give another ticket. That's so you could buy it for a buddy who's not in the system, or okay, just yeah. I, I, I would think so no. because you, if you walk out, um, I'm trying to remember, Keith. Did I think? Do they take your? I think they take your badge. They take your ticket when you go to the library. They take the ticket. Right. They get you a little raffle ticket stub is what they did last year. Yes. And they're looking yes. at how they're going to do it this year. And you just kind of stick that in your badge holder. They see that ticket stub. They know you're clear for that session. Right, right. Now, when you check out a game, they take your badge. <laughs> so you do have to hang on to that stub at least. <laughs> That's right. So, so the gaming library, definitely a great place to go and, and play games. Uh, I'm also interested in checking out the Malifaux rules demo because they're releasing the second uh, edition of that. Uh, I was very kindly gifted with um, a Malifaux starter set and the version 1.5 rules from one of our viewers, um, Christopher Dick, and he's going to be there demoing. And so I'm really excited to be able to go there and meet him in person and have him teach me the game, which I think is going to be fantastic. So I'm, I'm hoping 
I can get into one of his uh, his uh, scheduled events to be demo the game. Um, and then another one I'm thinking about is going to, uh, you mentioned RPGs, John. I'm thinking maybe of trying out Iron Kingdoms, which is the role-playing game set in the War Machine universe. It's not yes. something I'll, pr- something I probably won't get a chance to play here. And so I thought, well, this might be a, a fun way to try it out and see if, see if I like it or not. Um, Amongst and, other things, you don't get a chance to play there. Yes, yes, amongst so many things. Well, when you have 9,000 events, I mean, it's it's crazy the things that you realize you, you don't get to do. Um, the other thing I was thinking about was maybe taking in one of the, I don't know, clinics or training sessions on building battlefield terrain for miniatures games. So they have a lot of different events like this where you can be taught painting miniatures, uh, aspects of painting miniatures. So if you just want to focus on shading, if you want to focus on customizing miniatures, so cutting them up, putting them back together again so you can customize them, um, creating custom molds and things like this. And oftentimes, if it's something like painting a miniature, your ticket price includes a miniature and the paints that you're going to use that they supply for you, and you get to take the miniature when you go, right? So that's pretty neat. So I'm, I may try uh, try a little something on uh, learning how to build uh, tabletop terrain. But aside from all of the events that you can get out of the event schedule, there's also lots of things to do that aren't in the event schedule. So, uh, John, do you have anything like that that you're sort of interested in doing at Gen Con that isn't in the book? Well, amongst the 40,000 people plus that are going to be there, I'm probably going to meet some new people to have fun times with. And it'd be, it'd be nice to, to have some games with uh, the podcasters that I listen to. Like, I'll probably... I'm guessing be able to play a game with the Seeker Cabal guy since you're kind of, uh, well, to not put uh, too fine a point on it, kind of in bed with those guys because uh, you're sharing the room, I think, with them. Right? Um, oh, I think Brian's having a heart attack about that already. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's, he's going to bring an air mattress and put like a chicken wire fence around it. Right? <laughs> I think you're right. <laughs> yeah. So that, I think that'll be fun. And something that I noticed especially absent from the catalog was Artemis. That wasn't in there, but I heard good things about it from last year, so I don't know if it's not going to be there this year or they're just late in updating it. Keith, do you know anything about that? I don't know, but I know that a lot of things do get added later, and they may not have got everything organized and laid out yet. But it seemed like it was really successful last year, so I can't imagine it not being there. Right. Okay, that's good to hear because I'm because I think that's a really interesting, uh, interesting game. So if people aren't familiar, it's like a a real time space c- combat simulator where everybody has a, like a laptop station where they have a different position as a bridge crew on on a starship. So that'll be really fun, and kind of like you, Keith, I'm going to even though this is my first year. I really want to experience what the con's all about. I am going to to volunteer at the Stronghold Games booth because I've been in contact with uh, Stephen Bonacore a couple times, and he's a really good um, person to email back and forth with about games and really good customer service from them. And I have a fair number of their games, so I'm going to help him out and get my kind of, get my name out there in the industry a little bit. I and, really thought about doing that as well, except I wasn't <clears> willing to give up my exhibit all the time. Right. Yeah, and uh, and lastly, on on the Saturday, that's actually my birthday, so I have to figure out some some fun things to do on that. So that'll be good. What a great way to celebrate your birthday! Oh my goodness, <laughs> birthday presents to me. That's awesome. I can buy all the games I want on that day. And you were gonna have such a good pass with your girlfriend there. <laughs> <laughs> what about you, Keith? What are things that you're looking forward to that aren't things you can sign up for? The big thing is the exhibit hall. It's still one of my favorite parts of Gen Con, um, especially when I did even more in it last year than I had in years past. Um, it's just so big, and there's so much to see. Uh, even things that I'm not really interested in, I'll go and look at everything in there. Uh, but I'll play demos a lot now, and I'll sit down and flop down and play a demo for about anything in there. So I get a lot of gaming done in the exhibit hall. Uh, you meet a lot of interesting people. Um, you know, the first time I ran into Rodney at Gen Con was actually in the exhibit hall. That's right, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, most of the people that I'd like to meet, that's where I find them the first time and run into them. And you get to meet the designers of your favorite games and the publishers of your favorite games, and you find out, man, these are just great people like everybody else here. 
and those are the experiences that you can't get outside of the con, and that's, and that's why Gen Con is such a too, special right? place. Yeah, that's free. Yeah, you yeah. don't have to pay. Well, it's free to try the games, but I leave with a big bag of stuff cost. that is not free. <laughs> uh, they didn't cost. <laughs> yeah, when when I'm walking, I had the big smash up bag, and mine lasted about. 15 minutes before the strap broke under the weight of all the crap I had inside that bag. Uh, and so then I had to shuffle into other bags. But, I mean, I literally had 10 games within an hour of the hall door opening because I just stocked up on just on piles of junk. And <laughs> here's my money, take it, because uh, that's who I am. Um, so that's a big thing. Uh, the other thing I really want to do is is to just meet some of the people that I talk to on Twitter all the time. A lot of the people that are in the hobby from the people that make the games to the people that talk about the games and just meet them and say hi in person. Um, that's one of my favorite things to do at Gen Con as well, besides play games. It's look at the new stuff, say hi to the people and meet some friends and play games. And that's what it's all about. And I agree. That's that's definitely one of the things on my list too. Is is just being able to meet a lot of people um, that I really only get to talk to or interact with um, online, like we're doing right now, Keith. Like I, you know, it, it's 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 really great. It's like going. I think of it like going back to camp. You know, when you go to camp every year, and you need to go back and get reunited with all those friends that you know, and you pick those things right up. And it's such a fun environment to do it in. I mean. Come on, it's like pure entertainment the whole time. So, so it's a it's a really nice environment to reconnect with people, and uh, I'm really looking forward to that for sure. Um, I'm also looking forward uh, to this year's Gen Con, and I know I've said this a bunch of different times in different places, but I am having a, a Blood Bowl match with Jamie from the Secret Cabal Gaming Podcast. I have my one half painted miniature here. <laughs> I will finish the rest of this team. <laughs> And um, I've never played a Blood Bowl. Jamie hasn't either, at least not the tabletop version. So we are going to bone up on the rules, and uh, we're going to play. And I, I'm really looking forward to that, and I'm looking forward to winning. And Where is this to... happening? Because I know there has to be a big crowd assembled for this. <laughs> yeah, it would probably just be me and Jamie we're in the corner by bets. ourselves. <laughs> we're going to be taking bets. I think, oh, yeah. I think right now, I mean, we're just planning. <laughs> we haven't really talked about it, honestly. Um, I imagine we would just do it in the main gaming hall. Um, but who knows? And that's an interesting thing, too, because you can do a lot of gaming outside of the gaming hall. Um, I played a lot of games. Um, not, maybe not a lot, but I, certainly in the evenings, um, sometimes I would leave the gaming library and just go with a couple buddies, and we'd just go play out in a hallway. There's tables all around. If you don't want to buy, pay for the tickets to go into the library, there's lots of other places you can go just to sit down at a table and play a game. I, I played with some viewers last year. We played a fantastic game of Blood Bowl Team Manager. Across from us, there was other people set up a full game of Mansions of Madness and just playing that. Um, we played some uh, some uh, role playing games at, at restaurants, um, hotel lobbies, and nice. at, back at people's hotel rooms. Everywhere you go, you're going to find people gaming. And uh, and as I said, everyone seems to be really really friendly, and it's not hard to find a game, uh, especially if you're if you're comfortable going just a little bit outside your comfort zone and approaching people. You will find people are generally pretty eager to meet new people and to include you. So it, it's it's really cool that way. Um, so I think those are those are the main things that I'm looking forward to that are sort of outside the planned events. But let's go back to those events for a second and maybe just quickly run through a few different events that we're not going to, but might just give people a sense of the other kinds of things that, that you can do. I did have so one other non-event that I thought of. Oh, Keith, go for it then. Um, last year, I noticed this area. I... Uh, was looking, I'd heard about Compounded, and I was hoping to get to check it out. And unfortunately, I didn't get to see it there on the floor, but uh, Jason Katarski had sent me over to where Chris Kirkman was at. But Chris was in the middle of playing a prototype game of Chicken Caesar with Brian Fisher, and I discovered this hall full of people playing a lot of prototype games. And that was a fascinating place to go watch and check out. And I actually played the uh, Core Worlds uh, Galactic Orders expansion with the designer. Andrew Parks. With Andrew it's Parks. So That's yes. correct. Uh, great guy. He won because he's a big cheater because he made the game. But that's beside the point. Um, it was fantastic time. Uh, but 
that hallway, there's a lot of interesting games. So if you want to see the future, and especially a lot of stuff that will show up on Kickstarter and places like that, um, that hall is probably going to be off to the side in that area again. Uh, you'll see, there's a lot of Game Salute events that run there during the day, and then kind of after hours is when you see a lot of the prototypes hitting the table. So it's worth walking around and seeing what's going on at these tables. If you stop and look, people will talk to you. They'll let you know what's going on, tell you about their game, because uh, they want to generate that interest. So that right. is another non-event that's really good to check out. That sounds cool. Um, one thing I thought of when you're talking about the exhibit hall, just before we talk about some other things that are going on, now is it like a cash only thing, or do they take credit cards and stuff like that? Depends on who you're shopping with. Uh, most of the big event vendors are going to take credit cards, okay. but there's a few cash only places, most likely. But most places, if they're smart, they have it set up to take credit cards. Uh, okay. It's good to know. Yeah. All right. So when you go, like I said and look through these 9,000 events, you start to see some, some kind of odd things that you might not really expect to see at a gaming convention. So I did notice that there's an intro sword fighting demonstration that's going on. So if you want to reenact Princess Bride, uh, you can check that out. And I think uh, you and Pep had a little bit of experience with, with some sort of weaponry last year, right, Rodney? <laughs> yeah, we sure did. Pep saw an option to build a foam sword, your own foam sword, and then you could take it with you. Um, and that was definitely, it wasn't something that immediately appealed to me, but he wanted to do it, and I thought, you know what, let's, let's, let's give this a shot. This will be unique. This will create a story at least, and you know what? We had a lot of fun. I had a great time. So we get to build our own swords, which you then have to figure out how you're going to get home and explain to the flight attendants, but anyway, we, um, we get to to build our swords, and then we got to fight with them. So they had an area set up with uh, with a couple of instructors, a couple of rafts or whatever, and they give you some pointers. And then you just got to go at it, and and it was it was a lot of fun. It was really really good, John. <laughs> so I would definitely recommend that to, to people if they if they thought they might even just a little bit interested. It was it was pretty good time. Yep, yeah, there's good time. lots lots of active things to do. I've noticed. Yeah, absolutely. What about you, Keith? You got anything? Um, there are lots of uh, events that are things I won't necessarily attend, but there's a lot of interesting things out there. Um, True Dungeon is an experience in and of itself. Uh, it has a big setup. It's not a cheap event. I think it's $44 for a ticket, and it's got a little bit of CCG in it where you get these little tokens that represent equipment, and there's rare ones and super rare ones and things like that. Um, I did it once uh, because it'd be interesting. It's kind of like a little live action RPG. Um, my but you're literally go going great. through it, Keith. You're literally going through a dungeon, right? Like they set up an area. They set up a little dungeon. It's it's good 1970s cheesy D and D tech for the most part. There's some cool stuff in there, and you know they put a lot of hard work into it. It's neat. Uh, my experience wasn't great, but and I'll tell you this. It's probably great if you do it with your friends. And I did it on my own, and we were kind of a pickup group, and so we weren't really organized, and which made it harder. And it just it just kind of fell apart toward the end. But if you're going to do it, do it with a group where the big group going through is either all your friends or you've got a full half a group of your friends and half a group of other people that you know well and then you probably will have a really good experience but it's not cheap and it's not a short event but it's something interesting to do once well I was looking at um, diplomacy uh, that's a game that I have but you need seven I think it's seven players to really have a, a good game of that and from what I've heard you know, at the end of a game of diplomacy, there's a good chance you will have broken some friendships. So I thought, you know, that might be a safe environment <laughs> with strangers that I don't know to um, to try a game like that. So they will actually teach you the game. They have a, an event where you can, I think it's $4, you get an introduction to the game, and then the game itself is uh, $4. It's, you can get a t tournament qualifier. So it's like a little tournament they're running. Um, so that's that's something I thought might be kind of interesting. It just ties into the fact that there's, like, just every game under the sun there is an event for that you can get into. So if there's something you've never tried before and you think you might be interested in, well, then there you go, right? What, yeah. John, you got anything else? Well, speaking of that, um, 
any game, like if you want to go to Gen Con and really like hammer the competition, any game that, that's not cooperative probably has a tournament going on. And like Settlers of Catan, Ticket to Ride, Android Netrunner, which I'm a little disappointed that I probably won't be able to, to play in that one. But if you want to get in and be competitive, kind of on a, uh, almost like a world level, because you have people going to Gen Con from all over, and a lot of these championships are world championship events. But you also have to consider that if you're going to commit to that, you're going to commit a fair chunk of time. Like the Android Netrunner is like nine hours. So you really have to uh, to plan your day well and, and really be interested in that sort of thing. And I think there's over 400 different tournaments going on over the four days. It's like 100 tournaments a day. So that's, that's crazy. crazy. That's crazy. Yeah, and there there is um, there's electronic gaming too, and you mentioned that right because you're interested in going to to try out GoldenEye, and, and it's it's not a it's not a big part of the convention, but there are areas where you can play, you know, Halo, Call of Duty, and, and that sort of thing. And I think the price ranges from six to fourteen dollars or so, I think. Um, so so yeah, if you're interested in getting a little switch from the tabletop to the digital, then then that's certainly certainly an option as well. And uh, and John, you're going on a, a tour, aren't you? Oh, I, I might, I might. It's hard to fit in because, again, it's off-site, but it, it's a brewery tour. So there's a lot of, I guess, microbreweries around the area. And it's $34, which is a little pricey, and but it does allow you to wet your whistle with a lot of <laughs> little craft beers. So it might be something I'm going to still tinker with as an idea to go on, but as of right now, I don't think we're going to go on it. And uh, going from alcohol to the uh, <laughs> other end of the spectrum. Uh, well, while you're on your drunken tour, you might just want right. to leave. <laughs> you might just want to leave your children in childcare, because there is an option to um, to pay for childcare while you're at Gen Con. If you bring small children with you, maybe you want to go do something that you don't think they would enjoy or whatever. Um, I think I wrote the cost down here. Uh, it is twelve dollars an hour, and you have to book uh, three hours at a minimum. But you know, it's it's an option. It's, it's an option. Well, and that child care tells you who's actually doing the cleanup around the convention, right? Because it's <laughs> child labor. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that that okay. So then another thing. Speaking of labor, um, there's a there's an event called Iron Designer. I thought this was pretty a pretty cool idea. So you you form a team, and this is a competition. They give you random bits and pieces to games. They give you um, a theme idea, a theme ingredient, and then you and your team have to design within one hour a game out of those game bits and the uh, the theme idea, come up with the mechanics and a playable game. And I, I think they, they judge them or have some kind of, I don't know if they have prizes or whatever, but just even if there wasn't, just as an idea, that might be an interesting thing to do. So, um, so yeah, and who knows, maybe you walk away with a, the next greatest new prototype for a game. I don't know. Um, Keith, what do you got next? Oh, then there's the events that really aren't for me, but it just kind of shows what you can do at Gen Con. Because for $2, you can learn a K-pop dance. What do you so mean you can... that's not for you, Keith? You're not fooling anybody. I expect to see you there. <laughs> you know it's on my wish list. Dang it. Priority number one. That's right. Um, then, there, of course, there's even more things for me. This one's a $10 event. It's a little pricey, but it's belly dance for everybody. And uh, I don't know if Rodney saw him last year, but there are some folks doing some belly dancing in the halls at Gen Con, and it's a little bit different. Um, but, you know, it's something different for everybody here at Gen Con. Um, the next thing, we do get a little bit more bizarre at Gen Con at times, and not that there's anything wrong with that, but you can also learn about beginner and advanced rope bondage at Gen Con. For ten dollars, the next so, year they'll add the expert level, I guess. <laughs> that's right. Those are the people who run it. That one probably well, won't go on my wish list. <laughs> well, do you, is that something they have every year? Is this uh, kind of an offshoot of the Fifty Shades of Grey craze? Actually, I think it was on the list last year because I think I laughed when I saw it then too. Okay, but you know, it may be because I don't know when Fifty Shades of Grey came out, and it may be part of that and why it's so popular. Uh, well, it may be something that some people that like cosplay and LARPing like. I yeah. don't, or it's just something people like. This reminded me of something. Um, I don't know why this reminded me of that, but um, 
last year Pep and I they had people set up to do uh, to give massages. So what if you, you want to get Pep like a do? quick <laughs> What's that? What did you and Pep do? <laughs> Listen, it had nothing to do with rope bondage. Um we were we in the halls there, I think it was near the, the dealer hall, they had a bunch of um massage chairs set up. You could go there and pay for a session and someone would give you a massage. It was very relaxing and a nice way because listen, Gen Con will run you off your feet. If you're doing it right, you will be exhausted uh at Gen Con. So so it was it was a nice little break. Uh, there was another event though that I saw. Oh yeah, here, here, I have to read this one off. It's um it was a session you could go to that asked the question, is the United States in decline? Could the United States collapse? <laughs> so I'm not sure exactly how that relates to gaming, although I suppose if it collapses, maybe we'll lose a source of important board games like Monopoly and Scrabble. Um, <laughs> I don't know. What do you think, guys? Keith, should we be worried? Um, I don't know. I'm not too worried right now. <laughs> okay. You know. When the whole planet does, yep, we'll collapse too. <laughs> John, do we have a maybe? There's a solution to this. Maybe we could uh, we could just buy more games at Gen Con to bolster that American. Yeah, I think uh, <laughs> everyone, if all the population of the United States starts buying designer board games, then that's going to save the U.S. economy. There we go. Sure. We've got the solution right here. Took a couple Canadians, but we got it. Well, <laughs> Indianapolis is coming. It's inside, it's inside nice perspective. Boost. That's right. Indianapolis has a nice economy boost in August because. Gen Con really brings a lot of traffic to downtown Indy, and it's really good for the city. And the downtown area has really embraced Gen Con. You know, the first few years, people are like, what's with the people in the costumes and all this kind of stuff, to now, welcome Gen Con, give us your money. Uh, yeah. You know, there's right. a lot of really restaurants friendly. that do special events for Gen Con. Uh, the Ram and Scotty's Brew House downtown. That's something to see for Gen Con just in and of itself, it, especially if it's your first time. They'll do theme menus for Gen Con with you know, fantasy theme menu items. They'll have um, dice that they give away uh, themed for that year's Gen Con from that particular bar. So there's some other things that where the city – you know, maybe the United States might be in decline, but uh, Indianapolis in August sure is not. It's going <laughs> strong. Yeah, no, that's true. Um, well, I think I think that was uh, everything that we wanted to cover. Um, I don't know. Like this is this is being streamed live as we're doing it, and I don't have a way of seeing if anyone's watching at all, <laughs> or if anyone's been chatting or, or asking. Maybe we've questions. had two comments or three comments. <laughs> okay, well there you go. <laughs> yes, um, but um, one thing I wanted to mention very quickly is that normally on Thursday uh, evenings, I shouldn't say normally, I don't know how often they come out, but the, the board rumors, they're a group of designers and uh, podcasting personalities who also run a, a, a live Google session. It's really, really good. They talk about a lot of different things. And uh, when I scheduled this time slot, I didn't realize, I was thinking ahead and realizing that I'm, I would be booking at the same time. Thankfully, they didn't have anything going on. Not that we would have necessarily pulled viewers away for that. I don't know uh, if we'll do this again or how often, but um, if we do, we will try not to conflict with, <laughs> with other, other shows that are already established and, and going on. But um, I, I want to thank you guys for uh, both you, uh, Keith and, and John for uh, being uh, co-pilots with me here in this little uh, little adventure and hopefully put out some uh, information that people will find useful. Uh, if, if we didn't, then you know what? I had a great time talking about this with you guys. That was a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks awesome. for the invite. It was a good time. Yeah, I excellent. appreciate it. And I will see you both at Gen Con. Absolutely. That's something we really have to look forward to. I think they tweeted um, 90 days. Is that right? 90 days till, till Gen Con? 90 days. Unreal. Unreal. Okay, well, listen... Thanks, everybody. Thanks for watching. We'll, uh, we'll see you again real soon, hopefully. Take care.